Uh, very pleased uh, to introduce Justin Thaler, of course, one of our own, research partner here at A16Z Crypto, um, also a professor at Georgetown. Um, he's going to be giving two talks. So today's going to be part one, which will be more of the kind of high-level overview and kind of why you should care. And then tomorrow we'll have part two, which is more about how things actually work um, under the hood. It's very exciting work, um, uh, sort of new proof systems uh, that he's been working on with a number of collaborators. Uh, so lasso, jolt, and the lookup singularity. And so Justin, I'll hand it to you. Uh, thanks, Tim. Yeah, so this joint work with uh, Srinath Sethi, uh, Riyad Wabi, Arasu Arun, uh, Sam Ragsdale, and Michael Zhu. Uh, Arasu was an intern here last summer, and uh, Sam and Michael are, are engineers here. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a talk about something called SNARKs. Um, and I'll, I'll start by giving uh, a brief survey of SNARKs. Uh, kind of, I start most of, of my talks on SNARKs with this survey, um, kind of keep it updated as the ecosystem evolves. Uh, but then I'll dive into sort of uh, a topic that's more specific to this talk, something called lookup arguments. Because uh, today I want to tell you about a new, a new family of lookup arguments called, that we're calling Lasso. Um, and then I'll describe uh, something called a front end, a new front end technique, which we're calling Jolt. Uh, that, of course, builds on the new, the new lookup argument lasso. All right, so obviously I'll, I'll say in much more detail uh, shortly what is a lookup argument, what is a front end, and all these terms will make sense. Um, okay, so uh, let me start with what is a snark. Uh, so in, in a snark, uh, an untrusted prover uh, claims to know a witness satisfying some property. Uh, so just to have a really simple example in mind, the prover might claim to know like a pre-image under some cryptographic hash function of a designated output. Okay, so maybe like the prover and verifier have agreed in advance that they care about, say, the SHA-3 hash function. And the prover is claiming to know just a, a W that hashes to a certain string Y. Okay, um, so the trivial proof uh, that the prover indeed knows the witness that it claims to know is just to provide the witness to the verifier, who can then just directly check that the witness satisfies the claim property. So in this uh, example, uh, the verifier would just like evaluate SHA-3 on W uh, and confirm that the output is whatever the prover says it should be. Okay, so a snark is just uh, any, a cryptographic protocol that achieves the same effect, but with better cost to the verifier. Okay, so ideally in a, in a snark, the proofs will be short and fast to verify. Okay, so uh, you know, snark stands for succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge. And uh, succinct is sort of just a technical term for short proofs. And um, at least I personally use succinct to mean uh, kind of any non-trivial amount of shortness. So as long as the proof is shorter than the witness itself, like the trivial proof is the witness. So uh, I call any, any proof shorter than the witness succinct. Okay. And I, I, ideally, checking the proof will be fast. Um, you know, again, I, I would consider anything that's sort of faster than what's required to check the witness directly for validity to be you know, non-trivially fast. Um, and I'll, I'll use the term work saving to clarify that you know, the proofs are not only short, they're, they're fast to check. Okay, uh, non-interactive just means the proofs are static, so they can like, be posted to a blockchain um, instead of requiring some kind of interaction between the prover and the verifier. And argument of knowledge just means that uh, the prover can't actually pr find a convincing proof of a false statement unless the claim it's making is actually true or unless it can break some crypto system or something like that. Okay, um, so let me say a little bit about how SNARKs are designed, um, at least aspirationally, and then I'll say a little bit more about how they're kind of actually designed today. So ideally, uh, some kind of uh, a developer would write a computer program in a high-level language, uh, like Rust or C or whatever high-level language you want to use. Um, and I'll refer to this as kind of the witness checking program. So you think of this computer program as taking as input a purported witness and just checking that it satisfies the property the prover claims it should. So in the little example from before, the witness would take as input W and evaluate SHA-3 on it and confirm that the output is Y. Okay, um, so I could, that's sort of the direct witness checking program. Okay, um, now in, in most SNARK tool chains today, um, there's sort of a two-step procedure to actually uh, apply a snark. So, so first you apply something called a front end, which takes that computer program uh, that the developer wrote and turns it into an equivalent representation in sort of a much lower level computational model, typically some analog of a, of a circuit. Uh, like an arithmetic circuit is typically what the snarks like to use. 
Okay, so you can think of the circuit as sort of an implementation of the computer program on some very, very, very low level hardware, kind of even more simple and lower level than like the hardware run on your laptop. Um, you know, this, these circuits have very, very simple operations that they can do. Um, yeah, and the, the reason to uh, go through the circuit is because the circuit is so simple in a sense that it's then very easy uh, to design um, snarks uh, to allow the prover to prove that it knows a satisfying assignment to the circuit. So right. I have basic question, but can every program be writ written as an arithmetic circuit? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the question is, can every computer program be turned into an equivalent arithmetic circuit? And the answer is yes, and asymptotically anyway, the circuit doesn't need to be too much bigger than the computer programs like runtime. Um, and I'll get into more details about, that's sort of the whole point of this talk is just how true is that statement concretely. Other it's questions? We all learned the Cook Levin theorem like, to define you know, empty completeness and whatnot, but here it's really being used in a positive sense very strongly, right? Yeah, yeah. And these reductions um, from computer programs to circuits, if you want them to be good enough for practical use, you can't just invoke like Cook Levin, which I guess typically turn, just considers like 3SAT. The circuits that SNARKs use tend to be sort of much deeper than um, depth two, which is, and, and you know, not just have terms of width three or something. Yeah, so um, it's a whole. Uh, quick, sorry, quick follow-up question to that. Sorry, I realize I'm suddenly speaking out of the screen or something. <laughs> Should we think of these reductions as being general across context, or are there going to be context-specific ones for given types of programs? Yeah, great. Um, so we do have general purpose uh, transformations uh, that can take any computer program and turn it into a circuit that in principle is not too much bigger than like the runtime of the computer program. Typically for any particular computer program, you could tailor the circuit uh, to the program in a way uh, that's going to get you something. Um, and that's always a tension uh, kind of generality of the uh, transformation techniques versus efficiency in any particular application. Uh, so there's always uh, a lot of work of um, kind of uh, protocol designers very carefully like tailoring the circuits to the specific statement they want to prove. And uh, yeah, uh, not all systems, uh, y y some systems are completely general, other others are sort of tailored to the very specific statements in the application at, of interest. Does that make sense? Yeah, super helpful, thanks. Other questions? This is, I mean, it's probably this is a sidetrack, but on the generality thing, is that all NP programs can be arithmetic circuits or all programs? Yeah, great. Um, I, so, okay, it, whether you start with a, uh, like an NP program where, you know, there's some non-deterministic input or just like a program with fixed input, um, if you want the circuit to be not much bigger than the runtime of the program, um, you, the circuit uh, the instance that comes out is really like circuit satisfiability. And what happens is the transformations in general introduce a lot of what are called untrusted advice inputs, where you think of kind of the snark prover as providing kind of um, help to the circuit um, to keep the circuit small. Um, a, a concrete example is, let's say the computer program needs to uh, like divide two numbers together. It's pretty horrible in a circuit to actually implement a division algorithm. Uh, but you could have the prover sort of provide like the quotient and the remainder and the circuit just needs to check because it's untrusted advice is, you know, the quotient times, you know, whatever you're dividing by plus the remainder equal to the original thing. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. And, so and just to follow up on that, like the P part isn't relevant per se, right? It's just the computation has whatever time it has. Maybe mm -hmm. it's poly, maybe it's more. But the point is the circuit's going to be as big as the running time or a little bit bigger even than the program time, right? Uh, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, and you do get into situations, so like some, some snarks for circuit sat are like really, really fast for the prover if there like aren't many advice inputs, um, but are, are not so interesting if there are a lot of advice inputs. So it is worth noting that um, these general transformations, you know, for specific programs, you might not need many advice inputs to keep the circuit small, but in general, um, actually the number of advice inputs will be a constant factor of like the total size of the circuit. Okay, so just like taking a step back uh, and summarizing the slide, uh, most SNARKs are deployed in sort of a two-step process where first you turn the witness checking procedure into an equivalent circuit, and then the prover uh, proves with something called a SNARK backend that it knows a satisfying assignment to that circuit. 
sort of put these two things together and the provers actually prove that it knows a witness that the computer program would have accepted. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so just a, a very brief summary of, of front ends today. So I, I mentioned that this paradigm I described is a little bit aspirational. Uh, the aspirational part largely being that I said the, we want our developer to write the witness checking procedure in a high level language. Um, so there are a number of popular front ends today. On this slide, I've sort of arranged them from like low level language exposed to the developer to higher level languages. Um, so like Bellman and Sircom are very popular uh, languages. People actually really like using them, but they're almost having the developer specify the circuit gate by gate. Uh, whereas this third category I have here are targeting uh, letting the developer program in higher level languages, whether it's Solidity um, or uh, you know, even uh, like uh, Cairo 1.0 refers to a Rust-like language. Um, it's not literally Rust, but it's sort of inspired by Rust. Um, and then there's a front end that will uh, go through the whole compilation procedure I described to ultimately get out of circuit uh, in the end, something like a circuit. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit more about the tooling ecosystem today later, later in the talk. Yeah. What is the middle, middle range between the first one and the last one? Yeah, so um, Zocrates and XJ Snark, uh, I, I just say they're domain specific languages that are a little bit higher level than, than Bellman and Sircom. Um, yeah, I guess I don't, there's not much more I want to say about that. Um, there's sort of a step removed from uh, having the, the programmer like just write down like the, the gates of the circuit directly. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Um, yeah, and there, there's a kind of a naturally a potential trade-off between um, the niceness of the developer experience and the uh, both the, the size of the circuits that might come out um, of the front end, uh, as well as uh, sort of how big a, a surface area there is for bugs, right? So kind of the more complicated the compilation procedure from the program the developer writes to uh, the circuit that comes out, the more room there is for bugs. Of course, um, the sort of less nice the developer procedure, the more likely it is the developer itself introduces a bug and like doesn't write the circuit correctly. Uh, so it's kind of trade-offs all around. Are there a lot of uh, hybrid front ends that sort of allow general compilation, but like rely on a lot of gadgets or hand coded libraries and things? Yeah, um, a, a lot of these uh, languages um, uh, do have sort of built in gadgets for very specific fun uh, functionalities that are done commonly. Um, they're often called like built ins or something. Um, so people are uh, sort of trying to. Um, determine the best kind of trade-off between performance and developer experience and generality and you know uh, surface area for bugs to creep in and it's a very sort of high dimensional optimization space um, yeah other questions other um, questions can I ask a question please go ahead yeah um, how do you make sure that the circuit actually corresponds to the software you're really interested in uh, yeah, great. So I guess I was kind of getting at that question uh, when I said that kind of the more complicated the compiler from the program the developer writes down to the circuit, the kind of more space there is for like bugs, bugs to creep in. So, um, you know, people have attempted and are continuing to attempt to kind of formally verify um, as many parts of this tool chain as possible, but there are a lot of parts of the tool chain. Um, so like actually, Almost all of these projects um, that do are aiming to expose high-level languages to the developer, they all go through something called a, a ZKVM, uh, which kind of means the circuit actually like directly runs a computer, like runs a witness checking procedure, kind of inside the circuit step by step, right? So um, if the and, and that means they wind up using um, what what people will call a virtual machine or CPU abstraction. Uh, where they specify some primitive instructions um, and the circuit actually just, you know, for each step of the computer program figures out which instruction should be executed next and executes the instruction and, you know, just does this over and over again, like in the circuit. Okay, and so um, there has been some work to like formally verify that the step of going from um, like a, a program in the assembly language for the virtual machine uh, does get turned into an equivalent circuit. Okay, uh, but then they have not formally verified that the compilation procedure from the high level language down to the assembly program for the virtual machine is, is correct, right? 
So, um, you know, the best we can do is, uh, you know, uh, short of, you know, formally verifying the whole tool, ch tool chain is to just be very careful about how we design these things so that what comes out of a, one end of the compiler is equivalent to what went into it. Uh, does that make sense? Did that answer the question, should I say? Yeah, but I'm, I'm like, when I'm verifying, I'm, I'm still mm -hmm. trying, like I'm thinking as a user, don't I still need to trust the compiler? Yeah, you do. Um, so uh, let me think how to answer that. Um, yeah, so often, okay, so different front ends work in different ways. Some front ends will actually spit out a universal circuit where uh, like kind of the circuit actually takes as part of its input basically the computer program to be run. Okay, and then um, uh, you only have to, like there's one verification uh, procedure that's going to work for you know, like any computer program, um, it, it, you know, you just have to make sure that the, the circuit is fed the correct computer program, kind of. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, you could imagine, uh, you know, there are other front ends that uh, sort of the circuit itself is program specific. It's not a universal circuit. Um, and then every time you, you know, uh, are interested in a different witness checking procedure, um, you're going to, like the, the snark verifier depends on the circuit it's getting applied to. Um, so you're going to have to make sure for, you know, every time you change the computer program that the equivalent circuit is indeed equivalent. Like the verifier is ultimately just going to make sure the prover knows a satisfying assignment to that circuit. And if it's the wrong circuit, well, too bad. Does that, does that make, answer the question? Yeah. 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 Any more questions? Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that um, the possibility of bugs in... This, this tool chain is a major concern in sort of the long-term usefulness of SNARKs. Um, and, you know, I think we can um, ultimately make uh, sort of the, the surface area for bugs, like maybe no bigger than like the current surface area for bugs in, in compilers from high-level computer programs down to what actually runs on your laptop or something. Uh, but the, the stakes for bugs might be even higher than usual because, you know, one issue in the compiler um, and all of a sudden, you know, like all of the money on an L2 is just gone or something like that, you know. Um, yeah, and I can say a little bit more about that if I don't run out of time by the, by the end of the talk. Okay. Cool. All right, so let me just say a little bit about how backends are designed. So these are like snarks for circuit set. Um, so typically these are now designed in a three-step process. Um, so first you give something called a polynomial IOP for circuit satisfiability. Um, I'll say in a moment what that means. Um, and then you combine it with a cryptographic primitive called a polynomial commitment scheme. And I'll say in a moment what that means. And if you put these two together, you immediately get a succinct interactive argument. Um, and then typically you can remove the interaction to get a snark, non-interactive argument, um, by applying something called the fiat shamir transformation. Okay. So um, this is how almost all SNARKs are designed. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, I'd say one of the two exceptions I actually don't even consider to really be an exception because it almost follows this paradigm. Um, and then the, uh, there is like a real exception which is getting quite popular now, something called NOVA, um, or NOVA is the most popular instantiation of this, this other version. Um, th this other uh, approach inherently uses something called SNARK recursion, um, whereas, um, the everything else on the slide, like, you know, you can apply it recursively, but you don't have to. So this, uh, I don't know, yeah, this uh, quote folding based snarks that, that don't use polynomial commitment schemes um, and polynomial IOPs necessarily um, sort of are, are getting a lot of mileage through using, uh, making heavy use of recursion. And if those words don't mean anything to you, just doesn't, don't worry about it. Um, so the snarks I want to tell you about today uh, do fall into this, this paradigm. Uh, so let me briefly tell you what is a polynomial IOP. Um, so it's a, it's a proof system where uh, sort of the prover sends a sequence of messages to the verifier. And, okay, this is actually a special case of a polynomial IOP, but it's all we're going to need today. So the first message the prover sends is kind of special. Okay? It specifies a polynomial. And by polynomial, I really mean sort of what you saw in maybe like eighth grade or high school algebra or something. I mean like, like uh, you know, 1 plus x plus 3x squared plus 4x cubed. Right, like a, a sum of powers of, of x. Um, that's univariate polynomials. We'll actually need multivariate ones today. Um, and this polynomial, if you were to actually like write down all of its coefficients or something, 
um, in, in most SNARKs would be as big as the circuit the prover is claiming to know is satisfying assignment to. So it's sort of, it's too big uh, for the verifier to learn in full. That would like totally violate work saving for the verifier. Um, so we're not gonna let the verifier learn the whole polynomial, okay? All we're gonna let the verifier do is evaluate that polynomial at like one point of its choosing, okay? Then other than uh, that one special message uh, that specified this really big polynomial, um, a polynomial IOP is just sort of a standard, what's called an interactive proof, where the you know, prover says some stuff and the verifier sends back a random challenge and the prover says some more stuff and the verifier sends back a random challenge and so forth. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, that's a polynomial IOP. And a polynomial commitment scheme is just exactly what you would want to turn a polynomial IOP into a succinct argument. Okay, so you know the problem with the polynomial IOP, uh, the reason it doesn't just directly give you a succinct argument is because of this big first message specifying this big polynomial. So what the polynomial commitment scheme lets the prover do is cryptographically commit to the polynomial, and the commitment will be really small, like one hash value or one group element or something. Um, and the commitment, any commitment scheme is binding, meaning sort of you know you think of the prover as like stuffing this big polynomial into a tiny box and it hands the tiny box to the verifier, that's the commitment. The box is like locked, right? So like once the verifier gets that box in its hands, the prover can no longer change what's inside of it. Okay, um, and so then later it, uh, when the verifier says, hey, I need to evaluate the polynomial at this one point, um, the prover can provide the evaluation as well as a proof that the provided evaluation is actually consistent with the polynomial that's inside the box. And sort of the verifier never has to open the box and take out the whole polynomial. It can sort of just rely on this proof that you know, the prover is being honest when it says, here is the requested evaluation of the thing inside the box. Okay, so polynomial commitment scheme is just a cryptographic protocol that allows exactly this functionality. Okay, and this just means we can sort of run the polynomial IOP without the prover ever sending this big polynomial and that was the only thing keeping the polynomial IOP from sort of directly being a succinct argument on its own. I mean, so, I mean, a question about that. So, mm -hmm. so after the initial sort of send the polynomial commitment message, like you need a protocol then that has a short transcript right mm -hmm. after that, right? Right. So to get a snark, right? Right. So it's not. That's right. Okay. That's right. And so we make sure that that's always the case. And that's generally going to just look like a bunch of a small number of random challenges, basically? Or? From the verifier and, the, and in the snark, all, those challenges will be obtained via Fiat Shamir, which means by hashing like earlier messages, so there's no interaction. And then the prover's responses will typically be, depends the snark you're talking about. Uh, the ones today, they'll, they'll just be um, really low degree univary polynomials, so just like a handful of field elements to actually write down all the coefficients. Um, and other SNARKs, they might involve more commitments to more polynomials um, and more evaluation proofs and things like that. And so should I roughly think of it like there's going to be a logarithmic number of rounds with like constant number of bits in each yeah. round? Yeah, every, every, every uh, SNARK I want to tell you about today, um, they're based on these sort of multivariate polynomial techniques and that's their characteristics. So there's logarithmically many rounds and there's like say three field elements sent per round. Questions? How does linear PCP-based methods differ from this paradigm? Like you mentioned, they are kind of similar. Mm -hmm. What is the main difference? Yeah, I'd say in the end, the main difference is um, that the linear PCP-based SNARKs don't need to use Fiat Shamir, and that can be nice. It can give some nice properties of the SNARKs that the ones that everything else uses Fiat Shamir might not have. Um, but nonetheless, linear PCP-based SNARKs um, are very similar, like a linear PCP is some sort of variant of a polynomial IOP, uh, replace polyno low degree polynomial with linear function and, um, and the cryptography used to turn those into SNARKs is very similar to something called KZG commitments. So here's just one slide about the different kinds of polynomial commitments out there. Um, so there's sort of three or four main categories and I've sort of uh, highlighted it for each of the main categories in green, maybe what's the most popular in terms of deployment today. They tend to be the most popular because they have the shortest proofs in their category, uh, at least asymptotically. I actually think for some of these, um, concretely, they might actually be bigger proofs than some things that are asymptotically worse, but anyway. Um, yeah, so KZG commitments are very popular because concretely they definitely have the shortest proofs, uh, evaluation proofs out of all, all everything. 
Um, sort of the and, and these linear PCP based snarks use techniques very related to KZG. So there, there are trade offs like kind of right and left um, with polynomial commitment schemes out there. Like you know KZG commitments have the best verifier cost, but they require trusted setup. Right? Um, you know uh, IPA, also known as bulletproofs, um, is uh, does not require trusted setup, uh, but it's uh, both of these use elliptic curves, so they're not plausibly post quantum secure. This third category is plausibly post-quantum secure, but the verifier costs are bigger, things like that. Okay, what, did, what did the green indicate? Uh, the, the green indicates what, you know, kind of most practitioners should be aware of, um, the most popular from each category sort of in deployment. And the reason is roughly because they have the shortest proofs uh, amongst its category. Other questions? Okay, so um, yeah, let me just uh, briefly summarize uh, SNARK performance today. Uh, so I sort of told you. A question yeah. on that. Just, so, okay. like, how much does what happens after the polynomial commitment scheme depend on the polynomial commitment? Like, is the rest of the protocol tend to look kind of the same no matter which of these you use? Or yeah, so um, up up to some technicalities, you can basically take any polynomial IOP and any polynomial commitment scheme and put them together and get a SNARK. The main technicality is some polynomial IOPs want to send univariate polynomials, others multivariate, and the polynomial commitment scheme kind of has to match. Um, and yeah, th there's, a, there's a variety of polynomial IOPs out there. Uh, there's a variety of polynomial commitment schemes. Um, I'm going to start talking in a moment about how the concrete bottleneck in most SNARKs is the polynomial commitment scheme. Um, but uh, the polynomial IOP can kind of help determine like how big a polynomial needs to get committed and stuff like that. Um, so maybe there'll be more uh, information you know, I'll, I'll cover in due course. Like, uh, but yeah, so you're saying let's really focus on the commitment scheme and optimizing that. And um, that's kind of... I think the way, okay, I, the, way to th the way I think of it is one should design a polynomial IOP to minimize the amount of stuff that needs to get committed. Uh, and then one can just choose uh, any polynomial commitment scheme to plug in, um, you know, to turn that thing into a snark. Uh, just pick your favorite uh, kind of trade-offs from the polynomial commitment. And so the snarks I want to tell you about today, they can use any polynomial commitment scheme uh, for multivariate polynomials. Um, and there are, you know, analogs from each of these categories for multivariate polynomials, and you literally can just pick your favorite one. So if you don't mind a trusted setup, you might pick one that's, you know, sort of based on KZG. Um, if you do mind it, uh, you might pick one based on bulletproofs, you know, based on this Hyrax thing. So we'll say more about this. So what's going to be novel is what follows the commitment scheme you're saying. Yeah, so we're going to just black box the commitments today, uh, which is actually one reason I wanted to talk about how you have a lot of choices of commitments. Uh, but now, from now on, we're not going to talk about how the commitments work at all. Okay. Yeah, so in general, today, I'd say the verifier in, in SNARKs is generally cheap, certainly much cheaper than direct witness checking. Uh, there is a lot of variation. Um, in terms of the verifier costs, but nonetheless, it's still certainly like sublinear costs, right? Um, so uh, it can actually be multiple orders of magnitude differences in like kind of how expensive is, is the verifier today. Um, but my main focus in this talk is on the prover because I think this is really uh, what sort of limits the applicability and scalability of SNARKs. So in general, um, the prover today in a, in a SNARK will be um, at least six orders of magnitude, so at least a million times slower than direct witness checking, than just like running the, the witness checking program directly on the witness. Um, now this overhead can be uh, heavily parallelized, so you can just like throw a bunch of GPUs at it and that's gonna help a lot. But still, if, uh, you know, if you make one computation like a million or 10 million or 100 million times slower, it's still gonna limit what you can, what you can prove. Okay, question? What is Stark? Um, that's a particular kind of snark um, okay. with, uh, I guess, a, a pro, you know, it, everything's trade-offs, right? So a, a pro is it's, it's a one example of a plausibly post-quantum snark. A con is the proofs are, are much bigger than um, some of the others. Okay, so I think the overhead for the prover can generally be broken into two parts, um, and they kind of multiply together. So um, I, I call it front-end overhead and back-end overhead. And I'll put up a bunch of words on the slide, but as uh, you know, the, maybe just listen to me speak. So, uh, sort of the front end overhead is like, how bad is it that we have to go through a circuit, 
you know, that we can't just kind of run the computer program directly, but we have to turn it into an equivalent circuit. And then the backend overhead is like, how much worse is it that we have to prove that the prover knows a satisfying assignment to the circuit versus just like evaluate the circuit on that satisfying assignment? Okay. Now, each of these overheads is at least like three orders of magnitude today. And they multiply together, which is where you get sort of a lower bound of a million fold slowdown for the prover. Okay, now the bottleneck in the resulting SNARKs is typically the polynomial commitment scheme. Now that's not always the case. Um, I think it's, it's very rare that it's far from being the case. I would say if it's not the case, you know, the right view is not that, you know, this, this SNARK uh, like has an especially cheap polynomial commitment scheme. No, it's that there's too much work happening outside the polynomial commitment scheme. Okay, so certainly for the SNARKs I want to tell you about today, the polynomial commitment scheme will be the bottleneck, and so I'm going to like very, very heavily focus on accounting for how expensive is this polynomial commitment scheme. Um, and yeah, I think certainly the polynomial commitment scheme is always a lower bound on the prover time. Say if it's not the bottleneck, it really means you should revisit the SNARK because the prover is doing too much work uh, aside from the computing the commitments. So you feel like that's fundamental or just kind of an artifact of the current state of the art? Um, is there some reasons, like is there some kind of vague intuition about why you would expect Yeah, the, well, the, in, the intuition is the bottleneck for the prover. Cryptography is expensive. And the more stuff the prover needs to commit to, the more cryptographic operations it's doing. Everything that happens outside of the commitment scheme is sort of non-cryptographic in nature, and it should be lighter weight. Are these two overheads sort of independent, or could it happen that you generate like a worse circuit in the front end, which is easier to generate a snark proof? Oh uh, yeah, like great that. question. Yeah, it can be quite very hard to keep these a, a clean line separating these two. And in fact, um, you you run into these issues where you might have a, a snark that sort of supports a more general kind of circuit. Um, so the circuit you apply it to can be smaller. But like for a circuit of a given size, it's slower, but like it still comes out ahead because the circuit's smaller and things like that. And what I want to tell you about today, and I'm finally getting to the, the new content. Uh, the questions have been great, though. I, I hope people don't mind if I take a little extra time, is um, lookup arguments. And I think they really, really straddle front ends and back ends. And it's very difficult to draw a totally clean line. Nonetheless, I think this view of I'm pretending you can draw a clean line. I think it's a powerful view anyway, um, to the extent that it's accurate. Okay, yeah, and if you're interested in more details about front end and back end overheads, uh, last summer I wrote a blog post about this for A16Z, so you could check that out. Uh, no, so uh, the SNARKs I want to tell you about today, so again, they can use any commitments, any polynomial commitment scheme for multivariate polynomials. Um, I think they're particularly interesting performance characteristics if the commitment scheme is based on what's called multi-exponentiations. Um, so these are actually, this is the first two categories out of the three I had, or I guess I had four on the, on the slide before. So things like KZG commitments, things like bulletproofs. Okay, so what is a multi-exponentiation? Um, so here we're dealing with a, a, a cryptographic group. Uh, I'm using multiplicative notation here. That's just a convention. Sometimes people write the group operation as addition instead of multiplication. It doesn't matter. Um, so multi-exponentiation is just a product of a bunch of exponentiations. So these GIs are group elements, and these XIs are exponents. They're numbers. Um, so if you did use additive uh, group notation, it makes sense to call this a multi-scalar multiplication because kind of exponentiation turns into <laughs> multiplication and multiplication turns into addition. And so the people abbreviate that MSMs. So that's, I'll use the acronym MSM a bunch in this talk. Um, and yeah, a lot, of, a lot of polynomial commitment schemes that are popular are based on, on multi-exponentiations. Uh, basically, the, to compute a commitment to a bunch of field elements interpreted it as a polynomial in some way, you literally just do a multi-exponentiation. Um, and typically, the committed field elements are the exponents in the multi-exponentiation. Um, so, so GIs are somehow... Yeah, so... The GIs is, like, fixed, or should I...? Yeah, they're fixed. So in, um, in, with KZG, these GIs are elements of a structured reference string that was generated in some ceremony. Um, Ethereum's running one right now. Um, and uh, for something like transparent, like bulletproofs, um, these would just be random group elements, which everyone would obtain by like applying a PRG uh, to some you know, natural seed of some sort. So sort of like the GIs are like magically fixed in advance. I think. Yeah, yeah. And then the XIs are like what you want to commit to. Okay. okay, yeah. And so it's compressing where you, know, you want to commit to N XIs and the commitment is just one group element. So that's why the commitments are nice and small. 
Okay, now uh, the naive algorithm uh, to compute a multi-exponentiation would just do each exponentiation and multiply the results. Okay, uh, I wanna clarify, an exponentiation can be 400 times slower than a group operation, right? Basically these exponents can be as big as like the size of the group. Typically these groups are size like two to the 256, <laughs> which means one exponentiation is like 400 multiplications because that's how much it takes to raise a group element to the power like two to the 256 or something. Okay, actually a lot of papers don't distinguish between exponentiations and uh, group operations and they're ignoring a factor of 400 if they do that. Um, so there is a non-trivial algorithm because you don't actually care about in this, uh, the result of all n exponentiations. You only care about the one number that comes out of the multi-exponentiation. There's something called Pippinger's algorithm that can kind of reuse work across the exponentiations. And this will save you a, a, a factor in runtime of about log n. Um, this can be significant in practice. It can be well over 10, okay? Um, on top of that, uh, this is another underappreciated fact. If all the exponents are small, are small, and I'll say what I mean by small uh, later, um, you can save another factor of 10 in the commitment time. Um, this is just analogous to how, uh, you know, computing, you know, like raising something to the power of two to the 16 is much faster than raising it to the power of two to the 160. Like this can be computed by taking GI and squaring it and squaring that and squaring that. If you do 16 squarings, you've raised GI to the power two to the 16, but you need 160 squarings to raise it to the power two to the 160. So your 400, that's like, you're getting that from 256 squarings plus roughly half that to sort of sum the things together? Yeah, that's exactly it. That's okay. where it comes from, exactly. Okay. Um, and yeah, so, so this 400 is if the exponents were like random, as actually they often are, but they won't be today. They'll be small. It's one of the main points of today. Um, and that's why, yeah, if, if, in fact, if it's actually like a worst case exponent, I guess it could be, you know, uh, 512 times slower potentially or something like that. Okay, um, okay so, uh, no, so if all of the exponents are at most k, and I guess it should be n. The size of the expo multi-exponentiation is, is more than the maximum exponent size. Okay, uh, you can actually compute the multi-exponentiation with just about one group operation uh, per like field element that you're committing. Okay, so this is like 400 times faster than like a naive algorithm when the exponents might be random. Okay, I mean, this is like a big difference in efficiency, which is why I'm highlighting it now at the start of the talk. So the summary is uh, multi-exponentiation based commitments when you're committing to small field elements are like way faster than general multi-exponentiations if you're committing to um, not small field elements and if you're not using Pippingers, everyone should use Pippingers though. And so in your construction, you're gonna take advantage of the small K thing? Yeah. So the, the snarks I want to tell you about today are faster for the prover even without the small k thing, but the small k thing buys a, an order of magnitude more on top of that. Is it, and, and so, so, oh, so, okay, so less than, so what should I think of as like little n for you? Um, you can think of it as like uh, a million-ish, okay. and you can think of uh, k as also a million-ish. Uh, whereas these groups have size like two to the two five six, which is you know way more than you know, it's two to the twenty versus two to the two five six. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about lookup arguments. So um, yeah, I said that these things sort of straddle front ends and back ends, and now we're about to see why. Um, so suppose, uh, as an example, um, I think it's easiest to present this notion with an example. Suppose a prover wants to prove that uh, uh, you know, it said it, it ran a witness checking procedure, uh, but it, it wants to prove that none of the values arising during the execution of the witness checking procedure were bigger than say two to the 128. Say because the checks it's doing um, sort of assume that their inputs are no bigger than that. Um, and, and so the, a cheating prover could try to feed the witness checking procedure like overly big numbers and it would like mess up the, the checks. Right? Like maybe it causes some over, uh, uncorrected overflow issues or something like that. So the prover is going to have to separately prove that none of the uh, elements of the witness are too big. Okay, so this is called like a range proof. Okay, 
Um, now, the traditional way to do this uh, sort of inside a circuit um, is to use you know, this untrusted advice I had mentioned in response to a question of Joe before, uh, where the advice would just be uh, sort of the binary decomposition of each number to be range checked. So if the prover wants to prove that some number x is between 0 and 2 to the 128, it would just provide as untrusted advice, like 128 bits, and you know, claim that uh, x equals the appropriate weighted sum of those bits. You know, that x, you know, that those bits are x in binary. Right? And the point is, like, if each of those bits are indeed in 0, 1, they're bits, okay, then this weighted sum here uh, cannot be cannot be outside of the range 0 up to 2 to the 128 minus 1. Right? So if the prover provides these you know, 127, 128 bits, uh, you know, proves that each of them is in 0, 1, and proves that x equals this sum here, um, then it has indeed proved that x is in the appropriate range. Does that make sense? So this is kind of the old way of doing things. And it's very expensive. Um, because you know, the, something your computer could do in like one operation, or maybe two, if it has 64 bits and 128 bit data types, is requiring the prover to cryptographically commit to 127 field elements. Okay. Now, fortunately, they're small field elements. And as I said, with uh, MSM-based commitment schemes, those commitments are pretty fast to compute. But there's still 127 of them. Okay. And there are certain other costs that also kind of grow with 127. Um, so this is generally, uh, we'd like to do better than this if we can. Questions about this? OK, so kind of the whole point of this talk is to explain how you can do better than this. Yeah. So here, um, why can't we just send bi in the open? Do we also want this to be zero knowledge? So imagine that, uh, so if, it, if you did care about zero knowledge, that would be one reason. But it's really a succinctness issue. So imagine that you had, um, like, every single value arising during the entire execution of the witness checking procedure needs to be range checked, OK? So it's the, even, you know, even sending like one bit per value is not succinct, basically. Other questions? Cool. Yeah, so in the, in the SNARK applied to the circuit side instance, the prover is going to commit to you know, all of these um, bits, and that's expensive. It's crypt cryptographic operations for like group operations or something for each. So just to tie this all together, so those are going to be like some of the XIs, uh, right, you're saying, in the commitment, basically. In the, in the commitment, the... I guess X is being used in multiple ways, right? So like on the last slide, when you're talking about the MSMs, ah. I'm just trying to connect all the dots, Okay, right? great. So you're, so you're committing to XIs there, Yeah. right? Ah, and, yeah, that's a different XI, but yeah. So in, yeah, in... Um, in the snark applied to this like range checking example, uh, these exponents would be uh, these bits, like bi's, yeah, and the bits would all be uh, committed. And you know, because fortunately, because they're like zeros and ones, like you know, it's only like the exponentiations are really cheap. It's just sort of uh, one group operation for each, you know, because gi to the one is gi, and gi to the zero is is one or something. Um, but nonetheless, that's still 127 group operations, and um, there are some things that happened in, inside these snarks other than the commitments getting <laughs> computed, and so um, 127 uh, things getting committed is not, not great. Yeah. And then just to, just to really connect the dots, so back when you were talking about the overall this sort of IOP approach, right, send the polynomial commitment, and then you get to do like, say, one evaluation, right, and then you do this other stuff, mm -hmm. which is cheap. Like, mm -hmm. this is, all of this is like the one evaluation that you're talking about, right? This is, this is the commitment, and then, and then right, right, right. later so, there'll be one evaluation. Like kind of at the end of the SNARK, the verifier is going to say, hey, you like committed to like one or a handful of polynomials, and you know, now I need to evaluate um, the, either all of those polynomials. There are ways to do batching. So now I need to evaluate some like random linear combination of those polynomials at, at one point. Um, and that also has a cost, and I'll, I'll address that cost shortly. I just want to show I'm not confused. So, so you go back forward mm -hmm. to where you left off. So talking about Pipitra's algorithm. Yeah. Right. The point yeah. is, this is all about fast evaluation. This is all about fast commitments. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah, polynomial commitment scheme has like two procedures. There's you commit, and then later the verifier is like, I need to evaluate the committed polynomial at a point. The short version is the the evaluation proofs. Um, people tend to ignore their cost, and they're not totally ignorable. I'm going to say more about this later. But um, because of very nice uh, batching procedures and also um, 
because a lot of polynomial commitment schemes, actually uh, the evaluation procedure is faster than the commitment. Um, it's, it is reasonable in some cases to kind of ignore the cost of computing an evaluation proof. In other cases, you can't ignore it. And we're going to see both situations today. Does that make sense? Yeah. So here I focused just on the cost of committing. Um, oftentimes, that, that's the bottleneck. You can't always, always, always ignore it, uh, the evaluation proof. OK, so yeah, this is sort of the, a naive baseline that we need to beat. You know, if I'm not beating this, I'm not telling you anything interesting at all. OK. Um, so, but lookup arguments, like their whole reason for existence is to try to do better than this, try to do better than bit decompositions. OK, so um, what lookup arguments will let you do is imagine, you know, we just were able to somehow initialize, like materialize, I'll call it a lookup table, just like a, an array of values. Um, that store all the valid values. So all the field elements 0 up to 2 to the 128 minus 1. It, I mean, no one can write down a table that big, uh, but let, just ignore that for a minute. Okay. Uh, then each range check, every time you know, the prover needs to prove that this x is in this range, is equivalent to uh, what's called a lookup into the table. All right. So um, let, me, let me give a little more details. Um, so in this range check example, the table, again, would just be all of the valid range elements, the number 0 up to 228 minus 1. Okay. And um, the prover will have uh, ultimately uh, committed to uh, the vector of values that need to be checked. Okay. So the setting in a lookup argument is the, the verifier receives a commitment to a vector A. And the prover claims that every entry of A resides somewhere in the table. Okay, so it's in a little more detail. Uh, the prover claims to know an opening of the commitment so that for every element of the vector A that opens the commitment, there is some index in the table that equals that element of A. So, so, so by opening A, you literally just mean like a X1 up to Xn such that if you plug that in, into the G's, then you get back the C and Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, more, more conceptually, you just think of the commitment as like a, a box with uh, something inside of it, and the prover's claiming to, to know the thing inside of it, <laughs> uh, whatever that means. Um, and, uh, and moreover, that you know, for that thing that it knows, every entry of it lives somewhere in the table. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's like in uh, it, you know in the range check example, you think of the the snark prover has like committed to like the entire execution trace of like the witness checking procedure applied to some witness, uh, but separately needs to prove that every element arising in that trace isn't isn't too big, you know, isn't like just cooked up to mess up the witness checking procedures checks, and so it would use a lookup argument with this lookup table uh, to convince the verifier of that. Okay. Questions. Okay, so that, this is what, are, what I call unindexed lookup arguments. Um, in some applications, we, uh, you need indexed lookup arguments. So this means um, rather than just there being like sort of one vector A with every entry of A needing to reside somewhere in the table, um, every entry A is paired with an index into the table, right? And the provers uh, in the indexed lookup argument is claiming that for every I, you know, uh, AI lives in the specific index bi in the table. Okay, so unindex lookup arguments are like, you know, every element of a lives somewhere in the table and i the verifier don't care where. Index lookups are like, you know, uh, the elements of a are committed as well as indices and the prover's claiming that each entry of a lives in a specific index in the table. bi's are also committed? Yeah. So, um yeah, so you, you know, I've drawn them as tuples, but you could think of like there's one commitment to the AIs and one commitment to the BIs, and the prover's claiming that this property holds. So for every I, AI equals the BI table element. So is there like a very simple example where it's clear this is what you want? Uh, jolt, so okay. if you just <laughs> hold your horses, sure. okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, most of the papers seem to consider the undinex case, but then the application we considered in this work definitely needs the index case. So, uh, But fortunately, there's a simple transformation, like kind of if you can solve one, you can solve the other. So up to this point, we're still assuming that both the prover and the verifier have the full lookup table. 
hopefully, right? Or yeah, I will say in great detail later uh, what the verifier actually needs to kind of know about the table. Uh, we are not going to want the verifier to necessarily have to like write down the whole table. Other questions? Cool. So now I'm going to summarize existing lookup arguments and I'll tell you about Lasso. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to tell you anything about how Lasso works today. Uh, that's for the talk tomorrow. Um, okay, so let's say we want to do m lookups into a table of size n. Um, so there are, you know, there's now a long line of work on lookups, and here are three prominent examples. So the paper that introduced the notion of lookup arguments um, gave a, a very good lookup argument when the number of lookups is like much bigger than the size of the table. Okay, so like the bad thing about ARIA is this like table size times log m, log number of lookups term. All right, we don't like that log being there, for example. Okay, but if the table size is pretty small, like it doesn't really matter because there's already an m anyway. Okay, so actually if, if you really do, if you have like a really small table and you're doing a ton of lookups into it, I actually think ARIA is probably still what you want to use today but you really need the number of lookups to be much bigger than the size of the table for that to be best. Okay. Uh, then, you know, some later works uh, sort of focused on the case where the number of lookups in the table size were about the same, say. Um, the, basically, the case where you wouldn't want to use ARIA. Um, and so plookup is a very popular lookup argument where the prover commits to like five times the max of the two, you know, number of lookups in table size field elements. Um, and like in every uh, existing lookup argument before the work I want to tell you about today, like some honest party is always going to have to commit to the table in pre-processing unless you want the verifier to sort of materialize the whole table like, you know, when it comes time to verify the snark. Um, so in all these lookup arguments, this is basically how the table gets specified to the verifier is um, it's handed a commitment to the table. And you know, it better have been an honestly computed commitment, or otherwise it's sort of going to bind the prover to the wrong table. Yeah. Is this practical? Because if it's a lookup table for, let's say, 2 to the 128 right. elements, uh, how can anyone do that? Yeah, so you can't for giant tables like that. Um, and I'll say much more about this soon. But basically, lookup arguments uh, today are applied to tables typically with like 2 to the 12-ish entries, something like that. Um, and it's uh, one reason is because you just uh, can't commit to giant tables um, efficiently. So I guess one question would be, do you feel like it was already in the air that people really wanted to use big lookup tables and there wasn't the tech to do it properly? Or is even sort of that kind of a new idea to take advantage yeah, of? I think, it, I, I think it was in the air. Also, I think the giant lookup tables uh, we wind up using in Jolt, um, uh, actually turn out to, you can kind of reduce a lookup into a giant table, into several lookups into smaller tables, in which case you kind of could use existing techniques, although I think that lasso kind of makes it easier uh, than the existing techniques would be to kind of decompose a lookup into a giant table into smaller ones. I think the perspective of doing a look, one lookup into a giant table is powerful, and we'll see why soon. Yeah. So what is the sort of trade-off point uh, with current efficiency techniques of where you use a lookup table versus something naive for like bit decomposition. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, so it depends on what kind of um, snark you're going to sort of combine the lookup argument with, because um, you know we're not at the point. I'm going to say more about this. Is what the lookup singularity means? Is it's a notion of like just you only do lookups, right? You don't do like anything else, and we're sort of not at the point, I'm not, I'm not even sure if it, that, that's achievable. Um, what, what we do now is like we, we turn in jolts, and I'll get to jolts soon, um, almost everything that happens is lookups, but there's still a little bit of work done to sort of uh, put together the results of the lookups into um, like a full snark proof. Um, and, uh, and so the answer of like when, when you should use bit decomposition versus uh, a lookup argument depends on uh, what snark you're going to use to uh, prove everything that happens outside of the lookups, okay? And so, some snarks, um, uh, like bit decomposition, uh, play not nicely with, okay? Because there, there are certain other costs, I know this is a rambling answer, there are certain other costs to bit decompositions besides just committing to the bits, which, which some snarks sort of pay a heavy price for and others don't necessarily, such as these opening proofs, these evaluation proofs for the polynomials. Some, some snarks, um, like only like one really small polynomial needs to be evaluated. 
um, and other SNARKs, like a much bigger polynomial needs to be evaluated. Anyway, so a uh, rule, I guess a, a kind of a rough rule would be, um, you should think of lookup arguments as um, very good um, amortizers. Um, so, bit, you know, bit decompositions, if you're only doing like one lookup, you should probably just use a bit decomposition, probably, right? Um, be, uh, for, if you're doing m, m different lookups, okay, uh, that, then this, this can be better. Um, and so what's happening is that for every, uh, if you ignore the n, for, for every lookup here, the prover's committing the five field elements, okay? That's less than like a 128-bit like decomposition. On the other hand, as we'll see, a lot of these are uh, like arbitrary field elements. They're not bits, okay? So like five, committing to like, say, five arbitrary field elements can actually be more expensive than committing to 64 bits. But then there are these other costs like opening proofs and stuff that also come in that might be higher if you commit to 64 things instead of five. Uh, anyway, so uh, if you just sort of ignore those intricacies, just compare um, like five, five M, uh, five, you know, uh, the five, five times max of M and N to like 64 M or something like that, 128 M, and pick which one is smaller. Um, that's the precise answer. Could you elaborate? So you had an interesting comment about amortization. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, great. So if, okay, let, let's focus on ARIA. Uh, maybe that's interesting because I've written ARIA as like the sum of two different terms. Okay. So there's always this n log m term. Okay. So n is the table size and maybe just ignore the log m term. Okay. So if you do a lookup argument into a sizable table, you sort of, you pay a, 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 a term n Okay, and if you ignore the log m, that, that term is sort of fixed. It doesn't matter how many lookups you do, you pay it once, it's done. Okay, uh, and then you have this m term, and what's, you think of that as like one field element per lookup. Okay, so if you do a bit decomposition, it's like, you know, say it's a 128-bit decomposition, that's 128 field elements committed per lookup. Now they're small, which makes them faster to commit to, but uh, 128 field elements committed per lookup. Here, it's, it's just one. Okay, but it, it still wouldn't make sense to do, uh, to do it if m was like just one because of the plus n. So basically you, you pay some factor that depends on the table size, you pay that once, at that point you've paid it, it doesn't matter how many lookups you do, um, and then you get like a better like per lookup cost. So that's the perspective you should have for lookups. Good. Yeah, so that, that makes a lot of sense interpreting these expressions. I also wonder just like about conceptually, should I almost think about the lookup table is basically capturing some pre-processing, which you're then sort of reusing across like multiple different commitments, or is that not? Uh, that, that, I think that's the right way to think of some lookup arguments and maybe not of others. Um, and I would, I would actually say, um, because an honest party has to commit to the table in pre-processing for all existing lookup arguments, that's a totally fine way to think about all existing lookup arguments, but we'll see if you view Lasso as really dealing with the table size 2 to 128, like no one's processing that table ever. So it's probably not quite the right way to think of it. Um, so yeah, uh, all of these works, um, you know, they have a table cost, uh, sorry, a, a cost for the prover that's sort of at least linear in the table size. Uh, there was a really nice line of work starting with caulk, which is only a 2022 20, paper. So it's, a, it's really recent, this whole line of work, um, that looked to push all of the cost proportional to the table size into pre-processing. Doesn't get rid of it, moves it into pre-processing. Okay, uh, now caulk and uh, it turns out all of them, this actually gets back to a question from before. It's very, they're tailored to KZG commitments and it seems that they really heavily exploit that Fiat Shamir is not getting used in KZG commitments. Uh, so it's, it's not clear that you can plug in other commitment schemes into the whole line of work from caulk onward. Uh, so as a result, they, they all require a, a structured reference string of size linear in the table size, because that's what's required to commit to a table with KZG. Um, and that's really limiting um, in terms of how big the table you can use is. Um, so like even something like two to the 25 size table will be like many gigabytes sized SRS, I think. And anyone who wants to act as a prover needs to download that structured reference string um, in order to use this, the, these lookup arguments. Uh, CQ, uh, short for cash quotients, is the latest uh, version in this line of work. And after the pre-processing, uh, the CQ prover commits to uh, sort of eight, eight field elements per lookup. 
Like, that's really it. There's no dependence on the table size anymore. Um, and there is some FFTs the prover does. Um, so that's M log M, but that's field operations, not group, you know, cryptographic group operations. Yeah. So what are some uses of these lookup arguments other than range proofs? Like, are they much more general? Like, can you use them for... Uh, looking up advice to a circuit, for example? Yeah, I'd say uh, they're used quite pervasively. Uh, they basically, anytime you, um, it would be like really difficult to turn something into a circuit. Uh, it's like, you know, something that doesn't look anything like addition or multiplication in a finite field. People will think about using these, is my impression. Um, for the advice. Yeah, and so, and, and, and you know, you, can, you typically can always do a bit decomposition and things become pretty easy to implement in a circuit once uh, you, you have individual bits to operate on. Uh, I mean, in principle, like anything can be done as like ends and ors, right? And um, bits are just like true and false. And um, so, yeah, and I think, you know, so I, people use it for like, you know, hash evaluations and doing group operations inside a circuit and stuff. Just anything that's not nice to directly turn into a finite field addition multiplication, they, you might think of using... Uh, lookup arguments. Um, they, you know, they, the whole point is they improve over bit decomposition pretty generically as long as you're doing enough lookups into one table. Again, there's this cost that's sort of linear in the table size um, that you can't avoid paying, although you know, Lasso is going to wind up paying a sublinear in the table size fixed cost um, yeah, for, some, for some tables. Cool. Okay, so now I can tell you about the cost of lassos. So, um, you know, sort of a family of lookup arguments. I'm going to start with what I call basic lasso, which kind of the simplest and cleanest and the most directly comparable to existing lookup arguments. Okay, and then um, there are two versions um, that I call lasso and generalized lasso, which apply to gigantic tables, say a size like 2 to the 128. Now, if the tables are that big, they need to have some structure to them. Like, other, no one can write down like the trivial description of the table, which is just listing out all of its elements, if it's size two to the hundred twenty-eight, right? So, um, lasso is the reason we have two. It's a little annoying, but lasso is more efficient than generalized lasso when it applies, but it needs a stronger structural property out of the table. We call this decomposability, and it's this thing I mentioned before of like one lookup into a giant table. So being answerable by doing several lookups into smaller tables. Um, and generalized lasso needs a weaker property uh, than decomposability, which I call low degree extension structured. And you'll see uh, by the time I'm done what that means. OK, so let me just describe the cost of basic lasso. And I'm going to describe the cost for index lookups. It just sort of makes the accounting a little easier. Uh, but it also applies to unindexed lookups. Um, in fact, Tomorrow, I will describe it uh, when I tell you the details in the context of unindex lookups. Um, OK, so to do m lookups into a table size n, the, the la basic lasso prover commits to n plus n field elements. And there's some other stuff, but they're low order terms. It's like little o of n, little o of n. Uh, concretely, it will also be sort of a low order cost. I mean, it really it's not just like slightly less than m and n. It's significantly less. Um, and moreover, all of them are small. So uh, every one of them is in the set 0 up to m. And I'll say more detail about just how small they are shortly. Um, so this I'll, compares to like the 4. You're, like you're losing a 4 from what you are talking about earlier, right? Right. right. Okay. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll give comparisons shortly. Yeah. Um, right. And so um, also, no commitment to the table is needed if the table is you know, low degree extension structured. And it turns out like there are a lot of tables that are low degree extension structured. And I'll give a few examples. Um, also, I mean, these are maybe sort of lower. The sorting thing is maybe low order. But actually, I've been talking to some projects where this really does matter. Um, in all of the prior lookup arguments that I'm aware of, the prover would have to sort of take the lookups and sort of sort them or at least group them by what's being looked up. And you don't need that in Lasso. Um, and also, you know, we can use any polynomial commitment scheme. If you don't use something like KZG, we don't need any SRS. Okay. Um, all right, so how small are these n plus n field elements? So they're all what's multiplicity. So they're just sort of counting for each table element. How many times was it accessed? How many times was it looked up? Okay, which means like two things. So one is like, um, you know, they sum to m, right? Um, because m things are accessed in total, basically, right? So like, you know, at most, a fourth of them can be bigger than four, right? Something like that. Um, and also, you know, if n is bigger than m, then most of them are zero. And committing to zeros is actually free in that there's no group operations at all required because like g to the zero is one, right? Um, now, this is where I'm going to discuss the caveat about um, 
you know, uh, opening evaluation proofs and how you can't totally ignore them. Okay. So um, in the lookup argument, one polynomial evaluation proof is needed. Um, and you know, this, uh, okay, for some polynomial commitment schemes, the evaluation proof requires like sublinear and n amount of cryptographic work. Okay, so uh, sort of at least asymptotically speaking, you can kind of treat it as a, uh, the evaluation proof as a low order cost because there's like linear and n cryptographic work to commit and only like square root n to open. Um, and there's also like nice amortization where over the course of the lookup argument, the prover commits to several polynomials and only has to like evaluate one. Okay. Um, but uh, some polynomial commitment schemes actually have like really expensive evaluation proofs and then you can't totally ignore this. And I'll discuss that more in the context of experiments uh, shortly. Okay. Um, so when I say that zeros cost nothing, like they don't really cost nothing. They cost almost nothing in the commitment phase. They do affect like the cost of an evaluation proof. It's like, uh, you know, maybe square root of N um, cryptographic cost um, and linear and N field work or something to produce an evaluation proof depending on the commitment scheme you use again. All right, so yeah, I just uh, sort of uh, put up a, an extra term in the cost here, uh, leveraging the fact that um, uh, out of the n plus n field elements, if, if, uh, you know, if, 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 if the n term is, is dominant, actually like, you know, uh, uh, most are zeros, so they're sort of free to commit to. And there are some other costs that then grow with n, but they're sublinear in terms of the amount of cryptographic work done. Um, so that just makes it a little easier to compare to some of the other um, commitment schemes. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm going to compare it to uh, Plookup and CQ because I think Plookup is maybe the most popular right now. Um, and then CQ is the best among the recent call client of work. So remember, uh, the Plookup prover commits to like five times max of M and N field elements. Um, and, and three times max of M and N of them are, are like random field elements. So they're arbitrary field elements. Um, there's also, of course, a table commitments, even if the table is like structured and so forth. Um, and so uh, I'll, you'll, we'll actually see some experimental comparisons here. But I mean, basically, we're, you know, we're, uh, basic lasso is committing to fewer field elements and they're smaller. Okay. Uh, now with CQ, remember the prover commits to 8M eight, eight field elements. Uh, actually, one of them will, is like a multiplicity, I think. So seven of them are random. Seven, seven M of the 8M are random. Okay. Um, so I think if, uh, if M, if the number of lookups is like much, much smaller than the size of the table, I think you'd want to, you'd want to use CQ, right? As, as long as you can like afford to have the, the table committed in pre-processing, right? Cause like CQ like pushes all costs that depend on the table size into, into pre-processing. And so like you don't actually, uh, in sort of the online phase, need this amortization property, right? It just totally gets rid of, it doesn't really go away. It goes into pre-processing the cost that depends on the size of the table. Um, now, it, it, you know, what, one thing to remark on is like, you know, 7M arbitrary field elements is, is uh, you know, the same as like committing to something like 70M bits. So actually in some contexts, bit decomposition could well be better than that. So it really depends on the context. Um, is how many you know, bits would be in a bit decomposition or something like that. Um, okay, but like if, if M is not like vastly smaller than N, I think you would wanna use lasso. Um, and I would actually expect it to be like 30X faster. So basically there's something like 3X coming from there just being fewer field elements committed. Uh, like you know, seven versus two, something like that. Um, and then all of them being small is good for another factor of 10. And also the FFTs um, might, might actually be comparable to the cost of committing to very small field elements. And so um, now I do want to put in this caveat, which is, uh, you know, this accounting just sort of didn't count for the time to commit to the lookups, like the things being looked up. Like that's sort of baked into the definition of a lookup argument. You can't avoid it, right? Um, There's not that like, that's literally free. It's just, it's sort of a fixed cost for any lookup argument. So should it be counted, should it not be? So if you do count it, um, we, these numbers don't really change much if the looked up values are small. Okay. But if you do have a table which like just contains random field elements, then you just can't avoid committing to like M random field elements just uh, by definition of a lookup argument, you have to commit to the lookups, right? So in that case, I think this like, you know, 10X speed up due to small elements will fall just to like, something much less than 10x, but there'll still be a nice, a nice speed up is my, is my guess. 
Okay, any questions about this? So uh, this is not based on, this comparison is not based on implementation. It's based on looking at commitment costs analytically. So yeah. In basic uh, last thought, mm -hmm. except M over K elements, everything was zero. What was the K there? So, so there, there. yeah, okay. So the prover commits to, you know, these M plus N elements and they're all counts. They're all, um, so they just count like for, you know, this N term is saying like literally for each of the N table elements, how many times was it looked up? Okay, now the counts sum to M just because there were M lookups, right? So, uh, you know, you can have at most, you know, M over four things larger than four, although sum to more than M, right? Which means like if a few of the counts are big, sort of just deal with them separately and everything else is small or something like that. Um, and of course, M just can't get that big uh, relative to the size of the whole field because these fields have size like two to the 256 or something. Okay, I'm cognizant of ha being over time, so I will try to move along, but there's not, there's not too much more I have to say. Uh, I want to tell you what Jolt is, cover some experiments, um, and a little discussion, and that's it. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so lasso and generalized lasso just apply to bigger tables. Uh, they sort of parameterize by uh, an integer C, so the protocol designer can choose the C, and um, it kind of reduces the cost that depends on the table size from table size itself uh, to table size of the one over C. Okay. Um, and the, you know, there is some, some cost where, you know, uh, if you, if you set C bigger than one, you know, no longer is it like, you know, the, le the, the thing in front of the end, no longer is it one, but it goes actually up to three C. Um, and I, I can, I can tell if anyone asks later, I'll tell you where the three comes from, but, um, yeah. What would you, you suggest thinking of C as canonically, a like two or something? Um, so in jolts, the tables are going to have size like actually uh, two to the 140. And so C might be like seven, six. Um, let, let me think if, uh, yeah, I think C, C would be like six, but uh, yeah, but everything will be small. Everything committed will be small. Right, but your, your point is like this one over C in the exponent is exactly why you can do big tables. Yes, right? exactly. Okay. Exactly right. Um, yeah, and basic lasso is just, gen uh, is just lasso with C equal one. Um, okay, let me give you an example of this decomposability property that's exploited by, by lasso. Um, and again, like this, it's really not a new property. I mean, our formal definition of it is, but people were doing things like this before. Um, so let's talk about the range check. So, um, what you can have the prover do, um, to do, you know, kind of 128 bit range check is have the prover provide as, as untrusted advice uh, C, C limbs. Uh, limbs is just, uh, you know, digits, but for base bigger than 10. I guess you got 10 fingers and C limbs or something. Um, so each of the limbs will consist of 128 over C bits. Right? So for example, uh, you know, if you're breaking 100, uh, you know, a number that's 128 bits into eight limbs, each limb would be 16 bits because 16 times eight is 128, right? So the prover, you know, commits to these limbs um, and, and just needs to prove that each committed limb is in the appropriate smaller range. And that, uh, you know, the thing being range checked equals the appropriate weighted sum of the limbs. And so we've really, you know, just focus on the, the smaller range check. So we've reduced the range check for a giant range into, a, you know, like eight range checks for a much smaller range. Okay, so we've just decomposed one lookup into this giant table into eight lookups in this table size two to the 16. Okay, um, and sort of the whole point of the jolt work is to show uh, that this is like a pretty pervasive phenomenon, probably more pervasive than people realize, and I'll say more about that shortly. Okay, uh, again, people were sort of doing stuff like this already. Uh, I'll also point out like, um, okay, so the, in the lasso protocol, uh, the only information the verifier needs about the table is to evaluate a certain polynomial associated with the table at a random point. And for you know, lots of tables, it turns out this polynomial can just be evaluated really quickly um, by the verifier directly. So for this particular uh, small range table, this is the polynomial to evaluate it. You know, it's a 16 variant polynomial that just the evaluation is just like a weighted sum of the inputs. Okay, so that's why no one has to commit to the table. The verifier just it does this evaluation itself. This is the only information the verifier needs to know about the table in, in Lasso. 
Um, yeah, so generalized lasso is like basically lasso, uh, but uh, it doesn't need decomposable tables. Um, it, it really just needs that this polynomial is efficiently evaluatable. And uh, that I don't have very specific examples to give you, but in, in principle, that's like a much more general property than decomposing one, you know, a lookup into the big table into lookups into smaller tables. Uh, we'll see, like these polynomials can be like pretty, like for pretty complicated tables, these are very simple polynomials. So you're saying like one reason that might be easy to evaluate would be because you have this decomposability. Yeah, decomposability right? implies maybe not. Um, but there yeah. may be other reasons why. But there may be, that. exactly, exactly okay. right. And I'm still looking for like a really killer example of something that is not decomposable but is LDE structured. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to find them at some point though. Okay, um, cool. Uh, at one downside of generalized lasso is that um, about a third-ish of the committed field elements are not small. They're like arbitrary field elements, um, even if all of the, um, even if the table itself only contains small values. So that is the main reason to try to use uh, lasso itself and not generalized lasso. That's like the main cost of generalized lasso is giving up on all of the field elements being small. Okay, uh, so now let me describe Jolt. So Jolt is a uh, new front end for uh, virtual machine execution. So this is a pretty popular approach to snark design, which came up earlier in the talk, um, where um, people basically will express a program in the assembly language of some simple virtual machine, whether it's the Ethereum virtual machine or like the RISC-V instruction set, which is a popular reduced instruction set from the computer architecture community. Um, or some projects will, you know, design their own uh, simple instruction set. Um, and, you know, then people will turn the, you know, program written in the assembly uh, for that virtual machine into a circuit that literally, like, the circuit itself kind of runs the program for a designated number of steps. Okay, so, like, every step uh, of the program, the circuit sort of figures out what instruction should be executed at that step, and then it executes the instruction and just keeps doing this until the time bound has been met. Okay, so what, la uh, what, what Jolt does is it uses Lasso to replace the second step with a single lookup into a giant table. What that table is, it's just the entire evaluation table of the instruction. Okay, so Tim, this was the answer to your question from before about why would you want an index lookup. Here it is. So if you want to evaluate a primitive instruction on like two 64-bit inputs X and Y, you would just do one lookup into the table that, you know, for every possible input X and Y, spits out the evaluation of that instruction. Okay. Um, and then Jolt, you know, the paper is going to work through all of the RISC-V instructions and show that the resulting table is decomposable. And I guess, do I have an example? No, I'll tell you cost, and at some point I'll give you one example. So, so, just yeah. a, so the index here is going to correspond to what? Uh, to the input to the instruction. So, you know, if, if um, you know, at step, you know, 1086 of your computer program, it's time to, uh, I don't know, compute the bitwise end of X and Y, where X and Y are two 64-bit values. Um, the index into the table is X comma Y. Um, and the value stored there, it, yeah. Okay, so yeah, uh, I, uh, try to wrap this up. Um, in uh, in Jolt, for we work through every step of the of the Risk Five um, instruction set, um, at, which is again a, sort of a simple but popular instruction set, which has you know we didn't pick it out of thin air. There are other like very very nice projects targeting it, um, and for every every one of those instructions or every step of the Risk Five CPU, uh, the Jolt prover commits to under fifty field elements. And all of them are pretty small. So um, all but seven are, are smaller than two to the 25, and none are bigger than two to the 64. OK. And so if you sort of do some crude math, sort of translating, you know, sort of committing to small elements into what it would equate if you were committing to sort of full-size field elements, this is sort of like five arbitrary 256-bit field elements getting committed per step of the CPU. OK. Uh, there are a couple caveats. So that's, really, that's really just saying like, uh, uh, sorry, like um, 43 times, you know, six 
times 25 plus 7 times 64 divided by 256. Yeah, that... you wind up like, you know, the way you wind up thinking if you do this stuff for long enough is like how many bits are in this field element, like sum up all the bits committed. Um, and yeah, uh, looking at the sum of the number of bits committed. And, you know, it's much cruder how the algorithms sort of wind up working, but that's roughly that's the, realistic. yeah. Okay, just a couple caveats. Um, there are a couple of RISC-V instructions that we handle via pseudo instructions, meaning like if we want to, you know, there's an instruction for division with remainder, and we sort of, you know, have the prover provide like the quotient and the remainder, and we check that, you know, with an addition and a multiplication that those were provided correctly. Um, so that, you know, each, each division with remainder instruction sort of turns into like two or three pseudo instructions, something like that. There are also some instructions we can actually handle more efficiently than I've listed on this slide. So some things are a little more expensive, some, some things are a little less expensive. Um, so I do want to put these costs in context of other approaches. So can I ask one question yeah. about this? So, I mean, because this is obviously kind of a key part of what's driving the mm -hmm. performance, right? Mm -hmm. So should I think of this as like, once you have this conceptual idea to use these kinds of lookup tables in this way, like of course, you can map all risk five instructions to tables of that form, or is that kind of, should I be surprised by the, that? Uh, there is a bunch of like kind of gross work to be done, but you shouldn't be shocked. And it, you, if you see some, uh, I'll verbally do the examples now, since um, that means I make sure I don't spend too much time on them. So like bitwise end. Um, so you have two field elements. You want to look at their representations in binary, take the bitwise end of those two representations and you know turn the result back into like a field, ele a field element, right? Um, so you can answer a bitwise end on 64 bits, two 64-bit inputs, by breaking each input up into like eight chunks of eight bits each, doing a bitwise end on each chunk, and putting the results together, like concatenating them. Um, the other instructions are more complicated, but it's the same flavor. Um, so the instructions are just simple enough that you can kind of just break inputs into, like their bit representations into chunks operate on each chunk, not completely independently, as in bitwise end, it is really independent, but, and uh, put them together in nice ways, just work through it for every one of the instructions. Other questions? Yeah, so it turns out to be really natural, I think, in the end. Like, it's sort of like in hindsight, oh, like maybe, of course, <laughs> this is, you know, the way things should be done. Uh, I mean, I hope that some people's reactions, will, I guess we'll see. Maybe I've been staring at this too long. Um, cool, okay. Yeah, so I wanna compare this to some other approaches. Otherwise, these are just numbers, you know, kind of hovering in the ether. Um, so Planck is a very popular backend for circuit sat. Um, and it commits to 11 field elements per gate of the circuit. And I think, I think seven of them are arbitrary, even if like the gate values themselves are small. At least six are arbitrary. Okay, which means, you know, uh, Jolt is committing to, a, you know, about equivalent to five arbitrary field elements per step of the CPU. This is like turning a uh, RISC-V program into a circuit with under one gate per step and applying Planck to it. Okay, now Planck is not tailored to these sorts of circuits that come from VM abstractions, but which have like a ton of structure. Planck is sort of like designed to handle arbitrary circuits, so this isn't really like a fair comparison. But Planck is used today a lot, so it's meaningful to say, you know, this the cost of, of Jolt is like applying Planck to a circuit with under one gate per step of the RISC-V CPU. Okay. All right, so not, you know, a natural project to discuss is the other one that's already targeted the RISC-V instruction set, RISC-0. Um, now, they, they're targeting uh, today, right now, I believe, 32-bit um, instructions. You know, uh, I gave you numbers, I guess, for Joel with 64-bit instructions. Uh, their cost would probably double if you went up to 64 bits, something like that, for the prover. Um, our cost would not have if we went down to 32 bits. So, you know, um, yeah, they're just, anyway, uh, that, that complicates the comparison a little bit. But, um, okay, I don't know full details of what Risk Zero is doing. So I, I try to be conservative here. I think it's, it's clear that their prover is committing to at least 275 field elements per step of the Risk Five CPU. Now these field elements are over a pretty small field. It's a 31-bit field called the baby bear field. So if you do the same kind of crude math I did before, it equates to about 35 field elements per CPU step. Um, and yeah, I get like uh, RISC-0 does not use MSM-based commitment schemes. So it's like, it's very hard to compare 
you know, like risk zero commits to this many elements, you know, with this commitment scheme that doesn't do MSMs to, to jolt, you know, which commits to this many field elements per step, which does use MSMs and we could use, we could avoid MSMs if we wanted to, but, you know, I think MSMs are really like kind of the good properties of jolt are most evident. Yeah. So risk zero uses Stark, like Fry, yeah. Fry based. Yeah, the... yeah, risk zero uses a Fry based backend. So they turn risk five into an error and apply Stark to error. Um, yeah, so this is really just meant to be very high level, and you know, I, I also again, I might be missing some costs in in risk five, um, in in risk zero. I don't know. Uh, you just you know, this is sort of the best I can do as a crude uh, sense of how different approaches compare here. Um, and then uh, the other uh, comparison point that I think makes sense to discuss um, is uh, not targeting risk five. It's targeting sort of a, a custom. Um, virtual machine called the Cairo virtual machine from, from Stark, Starkware. This was a virtual machine that was designed to be snark friendly. So it has just a handful of primitive instructions. It has what's called an immutable memory. Um, the instru you know, like the primitive data type is finite field elements. So it's all designed to like play nicely with snarks. And uh, they commit to about 51 field elements per step of the Cairo CPU, at least according to the Cairo white paper. Um, now Starkware currently works over 251 bit field. Uh, I don't think they have to. I think they do this to match the field used by their elliptic curve digital signatures, right? Uh, so they want that, I presumably, to be really easy to, you know, quick to prove things about. Um, so they work over a big field, even though they don't have to for other things. Um, but they, you know, they can't work over something smaller than 63 bits because they use 63, you know, numbers between zero and two to 63 to represent instructions in the Cairo CPU. Um, so, you know, today, like what's deployed, I guess, they're committing to about 50 field elements, you know, full field elements uh, per step of the Cairo CPU. But I mean, it has to be at least like 13-ish or something, just because the fields can't be smaller than about 63 bits. Okay. Um, all right, so I already, you know, did some more examples of decomposable things. Uh, apologies for going so over time. All right, so yeah, we, uh, we wanted to compare, uh, so we implemented basic lasso, which I think I think Lasso is implemented, but we only ha experimented on basic Lasso so far. Um, and this is Sam and Michael uh, from A16Z. Uh, I've done amazing work to get this done. Um, we compared it to Halo 2, which is a popular and highly engineered code base that implements uh, basically the Planck backend. Um, and it, it, it sort of gives the choice of using the Bulletproof polynomial commitment or KZG polynomial commitment. Um, and it has a lookup argument built in, which is a variant of plookup. It's not literally plookup, but it's, it's, I'm pretty sure it's inspired by plookup, and I think its costs are, are comparable to plookups, roughly. So just as a reminder, the plookup prover commits to like five times max M and N field elements, where M is number of lookups, N is table size, and you know, three-fifths of them are like random field elements, uh, whereas lasso, it's, it's M plus N, and all of them are small, okay. So um, I, I so Halo 2, if you want to use KZG, uh, you use the curve BN254, which is um, sort of the, the pre-compile in Ethereum. And with bulletproofs, it's the pasta curve. And there's a really, really nice implementation of the pasta curves uh, from the folks at Zcash, I think. So um, yeah, ni nice engineering um, throughout Halo 2. Um, the polynomial commitment we used in basic lasso is, is something called Hyrax. So I do want to mention Hyrax has larger verifier costs. I don't think they're astronomical, but they're larger. Um, I think uh, this is, we used Hyrax because it's built into the Spartan library, uh, which is, uh, we built on that code base. Um, I think the verifier costs of Lasso will be attractive, like when everything is done, but I don't want to like hide the fact that especially in these experiments, the verifier costs are, are bigger. And my focus is on the prover costs, that, that, that's really where this shines. Also where I think the key kind of scalability bottlenecks are today. Okay, so this is Halo 2 with uh, Bulletproofs uh, versus Lasso. And you can just focus on this ratio here. This is the speed up offered by Lasso. So um, as the number of lookups is much smaller than the table size, which is two to the 16 in these experiments. We're seeing- This is now like wall clock time of a yeah. concrete implementation, yes. right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And I also, these are all single threaded time because we're not done parallelizing Lasso, but there's a lot of parallelization available in, in Lasso. Um, and this is straight, just like how many milliseconds did it take for each? Okay, so remember, like the cost of uh, plookup um, sort of, it's, it depends on the max of M and N, right? So 
you'll see that the cost like don't really increase until the number of lookups is equal to the table size because it's like table size dominate, dominates and then n goes above that and then it's n dominates. Um, so, you know, the, you know, Halo 2 sort of does best when they're the same. And in that case, we're getting like a 19x speed up. Uh, but elsewhere, we're getting more like, you know, up to 50x or something. Um, okay, that's with bulletproofs. Okay, with KZG, uh, with KZG, it's faster. And I'll tell you why in a second. But, you know, you're going from a 7x speed up up to maybe 20, 20x. Okay, why is it faster in KZG? It's because bulletproofs has really slow evaluation proofs for the prover. Um, I mean, that's basically the difference. So you can't ignore the cost of those evaluation proofs, um, especially in bulletproofs. Um, but again, uh, in, in the context of a larger SNARK, there's a lot of amortization available and uh, things like that. The last table was also bitwise and, by the way? I missed yes, that. Okay. yes, it's all bitwise and. Okay. So I did uh, run, not on the same system, but just on my laptop, just to get a sense of how much slower uh, the prover would be in Lasso if the table was just filled with random field elements, it's about 3x slower, which is actually what you would expect uh, roughly if you go through you know, uh, the account. It's like a third of the committed elements are 10x slower, so you expect like a 3 to 4x slowdown. Um, so we would still get you know, uh, speed ups like in sort of every setting over Halo 2, uh, but they would be reduced by a factor of like 3 or 4. Um, yeah, so I guess that's... Uh, that's most of what I wanted to say. I think um, you know we're there's a lot of engineering left to be done on Basic Lasso. We like just finished the implement. Sam and Michael just finished the implementation, so um, I do anticipate maybe up to a two x further speed up for the prover in, in Lasso. Um, but yeah, I mean high level, it's just uh, the commitment costs. I you know I believe are the bottleneck um, up to these issues about opening proofs as well, um, and. If you commit to smaller and fewer field elements, the commitment costs are smaller. And the field elements being small really is responsible for like an order of magnitude, which I think is underappreciated today. Question in the back. So on your, it seemed like the workload you're simulating there is pretty synthetic. It's just doing random table lookups. Have you thought about benchmarking this on some kind of like real proof statement that's of interest? So in, uh, in Jolt, the kind of table that will be used is exactly the bitwise end sort of table, um, where the, you know, the big table contains the results of 64-bit you know, data type, and the little tables are numbers. You know, uh, it's exactly this you know, for all of the instructions. Um, and then in terms of the cost of the prover in uh, Lasso, the worst case is basically just big field elements. Um, and so random field elements is you know, within the... Uh, basically, the worst case. Right, but I mean, it seems like that, that's what—that's how Lasso works. But if you're comparing it to Plomp on a similar workload, I mean, is that a fair comparison? Yeah. So um, in in uh, so we're we're comparing to you know Halo Two, which has a variant of Plookup, which despite the name is not Plonk, but um, and three fifths of the committed field elements there are random, no matter what the table has. So you're talking about at most a factor of like, you know, uh, forty percent difference or something, um, and and I think for you know the the other stuff, <laughs> um, it's also I don't know about lookups and some of the other lookup arguments. The the stuff that isn't big is multiplicities, and some of it it's table values. Anyway, they're they're also benefiting some from it. So like the. The bitwise end is is what's considered, you know, is exactly what comes up in Jolt, and like everyone kind of benefits somewhat from it, and the others uh, that the ones that benefit less from it, um, like their their dominant cost by far are are the random field elements that are there no matter what. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is part of Joe's question, but you could imagine trying to do like a really an end to end. Comparison yeah. where you really start with something written in a high level language, uh -huh. right? Which then generates whatever pattern of lookups to whatever right. risk five operations it happens to generate and do the comparison yeah. on and, that basis, too. And that, I mean, and, and when Jolt is built, that's exactly what we'll do. Yeah. What, I, what I'm hearing you saying is that, like, actually, a lot of the forces that you're talking through 
that work here, you're actually saying are kind of, in a way, operation independent. Like you'd sort of expect these similar factors, whatever the workload. Is that sort of right? Or? Yeah, I think that is right. I think um, the stuff the prover commits to uh, in, in Lasso is going to be just determined by what's looked up. Uh, and sort of the smaller those values, the better for everyone um, if they're using MSN. I mean, maybe one just very simple okay. version. I mean, is there, is, does, like if you look at the risk five sort of instruction set, yeah. are there certain operations where the speed up is more pronounced versus others? Oh, I see, others? I see. And if so, then the question would be like, okay, okay. the programs that people care about, which are I the operations you. that are being sort of used the most, right? Yeah, great, great. So um, in, in something like JOLT, actually JOLT stands for just one lookup table. There's one lookup table um, uh, with, with one caveat. And so every instruction is almost the same. The two caveats are the pseudo instructions thing, like doing division by you know having the prover give a quotient and a remainder and, and checking them um, with a couple. So there, you know that turns into like two or three primitive instructions. Um, then the other caveat is, is some instructions we can actually do uh, with a much smaller table. Um, so rather than size like two to the 128, we can do size like two to the 33, two, 30, two to the 60, 65. Uh, it's because those instructions only depend on like x plus y. Um, so x plus y, you know, rather than having x and y, which is 64 bits each, you can operate on x plus y, which is 65 bits at most. Um, yeah, so uh, there's not that much uh, variation for different uh, RISC-V programs in terms of what Jolt would cost. For your system, right? But for my system. Maybe for the ones you're comparing to, right? There, Perhaps. there might be. I think that there also won't be so much there. Um, there, there's also probably pseudo instructions in other systems, um, hand, at least handling like risk five. I would, I would guess. I don't know the details, but like, I mean, I think you're, the way to do division is to do like a you know quotient and remainder. Um, also, they use different commitment schemes, so there's actually like even less room for there to be variation uh, if you use. Um, like these fry like commitment schemes, uh, like kind of all that matters is like, is the stuff being committed in the base field or an extension field and like designs so or everything's in the base field. And I, I don't actually think that there should be too much difference between, you know, committing to a one and committing to a, you know, maximal value in the base field or something in that context. Yeah, so you actually, uh, there, there's much less an empirical variation uh, that I expect than you would think. Everything kind of just costs what it costs. Uh, but obviously, we'll see for sure when Jolt is built. So, OK, I went so far over, so apologies to everyone. But uh, thanks for being such a great audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.